Hello students, welcome to today's class. Today we'll be dealing with the topic facets of health psychology and we'll be trying to understand what this field of health psychology is all about in terms of the major themes that it deals with and in terms of the roles that a health psychologist plays. Now first we'll briefly overview the beginnings of health psychology. As we know, health psychology was accepted as a separate discipline within the American Psychological Association and became division number 38 in the year 1978. A year later, in the year 1979, three influential researchers, Stone, Cohen and Adler, put forward their book which had the same title, Health Psychology. And then in 1982, the first official journal or official publication of the Division of Health Psychology began as the Journal of Health Psychology. Now, Brannan and Feast define health psychology as including psychology's contributions to the enhancement of health, the prevention and treatment of disease, the improvement of the healthcare system, the identification of health risk factors, and the shaping of public opinion with regard to health. Thus, in short, we know that health psychology, in fact, encompasses almost all concepts and all factors within the system of healthcare. Now, we'll be looking at four major themes that health psychology essentially has to deal with in its purview of healthcare management and in its purview of the psychological and behavioral aspects of health. The first is the concept of health and sickness. For all of us as lay people, health normally means the absence of sickness. If you are not sick, then you are healthy. But the question is, is it true? Now, health is not merely the absence of disease. And this is what the World Health Organization says in its definition of health. According to the World Health Organization, health is not merely the absence of a disease, illness or infirmity, but rather it is the presence of high levels of social, occupational and emotional well-being. Thus, a person can say that he is healthy or feel that he is healthy only when he can enjoy physical capacities to a satisfactory extent that help him in whatever explorations of the environment he needs to do, when he has a high level of emotional well-being, self-esteem, self-control and a sense of self-worth. And finally, when he is able to have satisfactory social relationships and satisfactorily close interpersonal relationships with others. Only when these three dimensions are complete and also there is no presence of disease, can a person say or can we say that a person is healthy. And this concept of health is what health psychologists strictly follow. And they therefore seek to promote maximum amounts of health rather than just focusing on treating illness. Now, another major theme or component of health psychology is the distinguishing between disease and illness. For all of us, disease and illness in general terms mean the same things and we often use the terms interchangeably. We either say we are ill or we have a disease. They mean the same for us. But let me ask you an important question. Do disease and illness mean the same things? If your answer is no, then you are right because disease and illness are two different concepts. Illness is a more subjective phenomenon. It depends upon a person's own evaluation of his or her own physical state. Disease, on the other hand, is a more narrow and a more precise concept and essentially involves some basis in body pathology, some kind of bodily dysfunction. Now, a person may have an illness but still may not have a disease. For instance, there is a student, say for example, who participates in two or three or more sporting activities every semester. And this semester, he cannot find the energy to participate in even one. So he feels that he is ill as compared to the last semester. But probably the doctor cannot find anything wrong diagnostically in his body. So here, the boy feels ill even though there is no sign of disease. On the other hand, a person having a disease may not feel ill. For instance, a person having some kind of disease such as a brain tumor or a cardiovascular disorder, at least in the earlier stages may continue functioning like a normal individual and may show no signs of illness. 
Thus, we know that disease and illness are two different terms. They may occur individually or they may occur together. And an important component of health psychology is to recognize these differences and similarities between health and illness. And an important component of health psychology is to understand these differences and subtle similarities between disease and illness so that not only disease caused by body pathology but illness depending upon the person's own subjective feelings are given equal importance. And this is in view of the WHO definition which says that disease itself does not determine health. A person's subjective feelings of well-being which may comprise illness also determines health. Now a third important theme or component of health psychology is its focus on illness behavior. When a person perceives certain symptoms, for instance, he perceives headaches or reeling sensation or fatigue or some kind of nausea, or vomiting or a host of symptoms that occur together and sees these symptoms as significantly serious, immediately the process of illness behavior starts. For instance, he may try to find out what these various symptoms mean. He may try to get information from various sources, say family, friends, relatives or even from the internet. Also, he may try to self-medicate or seek his own therapies, for instance, non-traditional therapies. He may engage in yoga, acupressure or other therapies. Or an alternative action would be to seek medical help. He may try to find out which hospitals or doctors are the best for treating this kind of symptoms and he may approach the doctors or other medical practitioners for help. And he may explain in detail his symptoms and discomfort to the doctor. Of course, it will lead to a process of diagnosis and the diagnosis may either reveal the presence of a disease or no presence or the absence of disease. The person may also adopt a sick role. For instance, he may seek help from friends, family and others. He may take a lot of rest. He may refrain from a lot of activities. For instance, take a few holidays from job or school and so on. Now, illness behavior that occurs when a disease is present is ratified and is accepted by the society. But often people also show illness behavior when there are no diagnosis or no confirmation of disease. And in such a case, illness behavior is often frowned upon or looked upon negatively. What psychologists understand in the field of health is that illness behavior can emerge from two sources. The first is the real presence of disease and the second is the person's own subjective feeling of illness. Fine, the doctor did not give me a diagnosis of disease, but still I am feeling ill. So I am still trying to find out what my symptoms mean. I am still trying to gain information and I still do not have the energy to continue with my activities as before. So I am adopting a sick role. I am showing illness behavior, not because of the disease, but because I am feeling ill. This may be another source of illness behavior. A third source of illness behavior may be when person adopts the illness behavior due to its secondary gains. This may be a conscious adoption or an unconscious adoption. Now illness behavior and the sick role have a number of secondary gains. For instance, you can take a lot of rest, you are exempted from a lot of activities, you get a lot of support, sympathy, care from friends, family and others. You no longer have to take responsibility for a number of activities or decisions and you are free to rest at leisure. Now, this secondary gains of illness behavior and sickness may also be one of the reasons why people engage in such kind of behavior even in the absence of disease. So the health psychologist has a complex role to play because this entire facet of illness behavior involves psychosocial, emotional and behavioral components. So he has to distinguish between illness behavior that is the genuine result of a disease or which is a genuine result of a feeling of illness or whether illness behavior is a conscious attempt to actually reap the benefits of being ill. Now yet another aspect of illness behavior is maladaptive illness behavior or abnormal illness behavior. Here the person is already diagnosed with a disease but he either denies it or fails to accept the reality of the disease and continues with his activities as usual or on the other hand he may actually ignore the medical treatments or the drugs prescribed or the dietary and other lifestyle changes that he needs to do 
This is basically because he denies that he has a disease, he doesn't want to accept that he is sick and so he shows kinds of behavior which can put his entire recovery and his entire health in great risk and danger. And here health psychologists again have to play an important role in convincing and reassuring the patient that even though he or she is sick, the practice of following medical regimens will only make him healthy and to help him accept this stage of his life where he is sick and help him progress to another stage which will lead to recovery. Now a third facet or third component that health psychologists deal with is health behavior. Now health behavior is the kind of behavior an individual engages in so as to promote health, to prevent disease or to manage a disease which he already has. Estimates show that almost 50% of premature deaths and 54% of cardiovascular diseases occur due to negative health behaviors, negative health practices and lifestyle factors. And so health psychologists have an important role to play in encouraging people to adopt positive health practices such as a nutritious diet, regular walks, regular exercise, proper intake of medications as also avoiding certain harmful health behaviors such as alcoholism, smoking or a poor diet or the intake of non-prescription medications because many people have the habit of self-medication. They may take any kind of medication, especially painkillers to a large extent even when it is unnecessary. Finally, it also involves encouraging people to adopt a healthy lifestyle to avoid risk behaviors. For instance, taking drugs or engaging in activities such as unprotected sexual activities and so on which may put them at a risk of HIV AIDS and such other diseases. Finally, the promotion of health behavior may also involve encouraging the patients and reassuring the patients and actually motivating them to follow difficult health procedures such as regular health checkups even if they are not ill or if they are ill going in for regular consultations with the doctor following difficult medical treatments going in for surgical or other procedures when necessary and doing a host of other behaviors that may be required or essential to keep them in good health and to lead them towards the path of recovery. The first role of the health psychologist that we are discussing is the health psychologist as an educator or teacher. The field of health psychology and its research and theory and practice has now been accepted into a number of academic disciplines including the teaching of psychology as well as other medical and nursing teaching syllabi. And hence, Health psychologists now have the opportunity to actually impart the fruits of their research and their knowledge which they have accumulated throughout the years to various students, researchers, doctors, nurses and other medical care practitioners. What health psychologist as an educator and as a teacher wishes to communicate is the importance of recognizing the various psychosocial, emotional and behavioral aspects of the process of health, illness and disease and the entire healthcare system and practice. For instance, a number of factors such as the level of acceptance a patient has of the diagnosis or the kind of fear and apprehensions he brings into the diagnostic process, the fear of surgery, his lack of knowledge and his lack of understanding regarding the process of recovery or even the kind of bedside manners the nurses or other attendants show can have a great impact on the quality of health care and the quality of health services a person experiences. And hence the health psychologist as an educator and as a teacher tries to communicate and tries to teach a host of health professionals including psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, nurses and other medical caregivers on the importance of enhancing interpersonal communications within the health setup so that the patients feel more comfortable and feel more active as participants in the process of recovery rather than as mere passive people who are accepting whatever the doctor is putting on them. Further, the health psychologist as an educator or teacher is not only confined to the classroom. He doesn't always teach or he doesn't only teach. He also goes in for a number of mass communication programs in different settings. For instance, he may work in employee assistance programs in business and industry 
and other community based programs where mass communication and information regarding a host of practices necessary for preventing ill health and promoting health are required. For example, they may put up anti-tobacco campaigns and campaigns which put forward the importance of engaging in safe sexual practices, the importance of campaigns preventing alcohol and smoking and so on, as also telling people why it is important for going in for regular health checkups and immunizations and a host of other information which can actually increase awareness regarding health care among the general population. The second important role the health psychologist plays is his role as a researcher. Now health psychologists who belong to the field of psychology of course are better placed to conduct research as compared to other medical professionals because they have a lot of theoretical, statistical and empirical knowledge on how research should be conducted and hence they can be more of experts in conducting research as compared to other professionals. But still we must understand that the problems in the field of health psychology are not so simple. The factors influencing health, illness and disease are not single factors but rather a host of complex factors and each of these factors have multiple causes. So this creates a rather confusing situation for a health psychologist and it requires a lot of precision on his part so as to deal with problems in this field and get appropriate answers. Now Altmaier and Mayer believe that the problems that the health psychologist as a researcher faces are of three kinds. The first problem is what are the various kinds of psychological processes that increase the risk for disease. For instance, we can take the study conducted by Glazer et al. in 1985 where he analyzes the impact of psychological factors such as stress in immune system functioning which as we know is a physiological aspect of the body. The second problem that health psychologists face is as to how to educate individuals to maintain a more healthy lifestyle. For example, in 1992 Evans et al. conducted a study in which he trained juveniles to prevent acquiring the habit of smoking so that it would not impair their future functioning. Research may also span other problems like the entire process of healthcare, treatment, diagnosis and the various correlates that occur when a person is diagnosed and approaches for medical healthcare. Now a third major problem that health psychologist as a researcher faces according to Altmaier and Mayer is evaluating the efficiency of therapeutic programs and this involves some sort of an outcome assessment as to whether the various interventions or therapies which are being used to improve the experience of healthcare are actually working or not. Another role of the health psychology which has developed in recent times is the role of the health psychologist as a clinician and it has led to the development of the field of clinical health psychology. Now as a clinician the health psychologist may provide either direct services or indirect services. For instance the physician or doctor may ask the health psychologist to ascertain or to ensure that the patient doesn't have any sort of fear, anxiety or depression which may affect the process of medical diagnosis or the process of medical treatment and recovery. In this case the health psychologist does an indirect role and he provides an indirect psychological assessment and he provides a psychological assessment of the patient to the doctor and thus indirectly assists in the process of medical evaluation. Now another role of the clinical health psychologist may be something direct. Here the health psychologist directly involves with the patients providing them counseling and therapy to deal with the fear, anxiety, apprehension or other possible psychological and emotional distress which accompanies the medical diagnosis and treatment. He may also put in a number of therapeutic and intervention strategies say for example biofeedback strategies, cognitive behavioral therapies and other such therapies. Further the health psychologist may go ahead to include in his purview of activities not just the patients but also their caregivers, their close family members and others helping them cope with the prospect of having a person ill in the family. And the importance of this role is even more when the patient is suffering from some kind of chronic disease or illness. 
Finally, we come to the case of terminally ill patients where health psychologists have to play a very important and a very direct role. Firstly, they have to deal with the terminally ill patients, giving them counseling, giving them a lot of support and helping them to live the last days or months of their lives with as high a quality of well-being as is possible. The second factor would be preparing the family members, caregivers and others for the kind of psychological and emotional turmoil they are going to undergo when the person dies and preparing them to face this kind of inevitable situation. And once the person has died, again the health psychologists, another role begins to help the people who were related to the patient to cope with grief and bereavement. Another newly found role of the health psychologist is as a public health psychologist within the field of public health psychology. Now the basic aim of the public health psychologist is very similar to any kind of health psychologist that is to emphasize the role of psychosocial, emotional and behavioral factors and correlates of physical illness. But this the public health psychologist does on a population basis, not on an individual basis. Thus, he tries to see various factors which are responsible for physical illness in a particular population, the epidemiology or the prevalence rates and prevalence patterns of diseases, other factors such as nutrition, genetics, biostatistics, etc. in a population, and to see what are the various factors, psychosocial, sociocultural and others that operate on a population basis and which affect physical illness. And so the public health psychologist plays an important role in advocacy and policy formulation and thus tries to enhance the experience of health and well-being on large populations. They may even have single intervention strategies towards certain at-risk groups. For instance, groups at risk of diseases such as HIV AIDS, promoting the knowledge regarding what causes this disease and how it can be prevented, the importance of safe sexual practices and so on. Or it may be directed towards pregnant women who are uneducated from rural areas. For instance, the importance of nutrition, the importance of having healthy practices, say avoiding smoking and alcohol and so on. Now yet another role the health psychologist plays is as a community health psychologist. Now the community health psychologist takes a very community view of physical health. He believes that there are many factors in the communities or surroundings where a person is living which affect his or her physical health. For instance, in certain communities, certain people may be subjected to a lot of stigma and discrimination which may lead to a lot of emotional turmoil and may have its physical health correlates or because they are discriminated against on a social or occupational or financial basis, they may not have enough resources to access health care. This may increase their health care problems. So these are the kind of problems that a community health psychologist addresses and he emphasizes that so as to improve physical health, the actual attitudes or factors within the community which are causing the ill health should be controlled and the rehabilitation process, the treatment process should take place within the community and should take place with an active involvement of all the community members. All of them should come together to recognize the importance of factors which are within them and which are operating towards creating illness and disease. Now a final role of health psychologists that we will be discussing in this lesson is that of the critical health psychologist. This of course is one of the most recent fields. Now critical health psychologists have their entire focus on social justice. They have emphasized in their research and they have discovered that healthcare practices, the quality of healthcare available, the amount of healthcare available, all of this is not the same for all people. You, me or others will have different qualities of healthcare which we are receiving. We will have different amounts of healthcare we can access. Now why is this? This is because there is a lot of social imbalance in terms of socioeconomic factors, in terms of age, culture, gender, nationality and a host of other factors. And what critical health psychologists emphasize is the formulation of policies and programs that ensure 
that all people in the world, irrespective of what social class they belong to or what their age groups, gender groups, racial groups or regional groups are or whatever countries they belong to, they have a right to access and to receive at least a satisfactory quality of health care. And this is what critical health psychologists are coming forward to emphasize. And this critical health psychology marks the transition of health psychologists from advisors, from people who actually put forward their research, to active advocates who actually struggle for the various principles and values they believe in and who struggle to make the healthcare experience a fruitful one for all the people involved. To conclude, we have seen in this chapter what are the various facets or components of health psychology. We understood it in two terms. First, in terms of critical concepts or terms that are important in health psychology, which are important components or form the basis of the entire ideal on the basis of which health psychologists work. We have seen the difference between illness and disease, the difference between health and sickness, as also the aspects of illness behavior and health behavior. Then we saw the facets or components of health psychology in terms of the many roles the health psychologist plays as a clinician, as a researcher, as an educationist, as a critical thinker, as a community member and as a community psychologist, as also a public health psychologist. So in this lesson, we have seen the kind of broad-based research and the kind of broad-based practice that health psychology seeks to employ and how it seeks to take the entire healthcare system within its scope, neither interfering in the medical process or neither interfering in any other process, but yet adding to the entire medical experience and not only adding but adding positively to the entire medical experience so that now we have a comprehensive view of what health is and patients can get a more comprehensive and a better healthcare experience.